representing the planet from capitalism, citing capitalism from itself. <laughs> and that is to argue that if we look at what's happened over the last 40 years, we've been dominated by a neoliberal approach to how the economy should be run. And it began with an enormous degree of confidence. Remember the old Tina? There is no alternative. I want to argue a progressive Tina in the state, in the state where you find ourselves now, where the proponents of neoliberalism are now talking about secular state notion as an explanation for why the economy is no longer growing as well as they thought it would, and why the whole world came to an end in 2008. I'm going to progress to this aggressive Tina. And that is, I can put forward an undeniable model that argues capitalism fails unless there are debt jubilees, which is, of course, almost a denial of what auto liberalists like uh, Schweiber believe <coughs> that capitalism only works to enforce contracts. I'm going to say you've actually got to break them to make capitalism function. And I can do that by breaking down my model of Minsky's financial instability hypothesis, where it's, which is where my work began and where my work is still focused, into three identities, not equations but things which are mathematically undeniable. The first is that the level of employment will rise if the rate of economic growth exceeds the sum of population growth and productivity growth. If I had more than 14 minutes, I'd show you the equation of this Undeniable, that's an identity expressed in a dynamic sense. The second one is worker share of output will rise in wage demands to exceed the growth in labor productivity. That's also definitional. The third is the, price, the price ratio of private debt to GDP, which mainstream economists completely ignore. It's been one of my battles for the last 40 years to convince them that it matters. The ratio will rise, the rate of growth of GDP exceeds the rate of growth of GDP. And those are three literally undeniable facts. You might deny the importance of one of them, but neoclassicals ignore the fourth one. They also ignore the implicit one there that change over time matters. It's a dynamic model. But I put them together in the simplest possible model, so I don't have linear assumptions for behaviour, which I know don't apply. But it's saying I'm getting all my results by not seeing anything other than incredibly simple relationships between variables. And what I get out of that model, which still surprises me to this day, is I capture what actually happened under the neoliberalism. And that was a debt finance bubble, followed by an economic crisis. So they didn't even look at the debt growth that was causing the economy to boom when it was burning, and they didn't see the crisis coming. This model generated both those phenomena. If you look back at what they saw happen, this is Ben Bernanke, what they saw as a period of diminishing cycles from the 1980s on, was an improvement in the economy which they could take the credit. They called it the Great Moderation, and Bernanke actually said this was a, a welcome change in the economy due to better monetary policy. So what they saw was this decline in the peak level of in, um, inflation during booms and the peak level of unemployment during slumps. And they projected that forward and saw that they were reaching that in the father of neoclassical economics equilibrium. Mm. Then this happened. Sudden explosion on un unemployment and inflation of 5% turned to deflation of 2% before quantitative easing and the gigantic injection of money into the into the banking system began under Bernanke. Of course, they're heading back towards deflation now. So that world is rather like what I can generate out of my models, because the model I just mentioned to you with those three identities behind it, expressed in the simplest possible fashion, which is just with linear behavioral relationships about wage change for workers and about investment for capitalists, also generates this phenomenon of falling and then rising cycles. That's the cycles for employment. The same thing applies when you look at profit share and also work wage share of output. And what's sitting behind that is a cyclical growth on the level of private debt to GDP, which again is ignored by mainstream thinking. Now, I put those three phenomena together in three dimensions. Rather than being inexplicable, you can see something of a pattern. And this is the pattern. So what you have is something that appears to be converging towards equilibrium and then diverges into breakdown. And it actually was first discovered in fluid dynamics by two researchers called Camo and Mandel. It's known as the Camo and Mandel root of chaos. And in trying to explain in a stylistic way what's going on there using a rather technical thing called a Poncare map, what they showed was you could map this as a process, a, a dynamic process moving between a straight line and a curve. 
and the straight line intersects a curve and intersects in two places. If it's tangential, it just touches. If it doesn't make a tangent, there's a gap between the curve and the line. And if you plot what happens in that situation, the dynamic process appears to stabilise and then goes through this gap and explodes on the other side. And this was an explanation for turbulence developing in fluids. But I've seen the same thing happening in this model that I built in 1992, before, not only before the great financial crisis in 2007, which neoclassical economists first called the Great Recession, but before the tranquility, beforehand that they called the Great Moderation. So it predates both the phenomena that it actually captures. And what you see is diminishing cycles followed by an expansion. When I put my little model on the side there, you can see that the same basic pattern in 3D applies in the 1D map that they show fluid type turbulence. So this is something potentially fundamental about capitalism. It's not something which can be reformed away. I'm not including borrowing by consumers here. I'm not including policy lending. I'm not including collateralized debt obligations, etc., etc. This is just when you have debt being, money being borrowed to finance genuine investment. You can still lead to a circumstance like this. And if you look at the historical pattern, that appears what it would apply uh, throughout history. So this is now looking at the um, this is the employment data for America. I'm now plotting employment versus inflation in two dimensions there. And if you take a look at the pattern, it starts from the dark blue and then it goes to the green and then ultimately to the red. And you can see it blasts out to a high level of inflation and unemployment, which was the period which enabled Milton Friedman to demolish what he calls Keynesianism, which is actually called Saxonianism. <laughs> <laughs> and then, without warning, once they put the bridge equilibrium, bang, blasting off sideways. And my model, when I plot that in three dimensions, has exactly the same shape. And I'll quickly show you the third dimension I'm leaving out in that diagram. And when you tilt them up, you can see the same three dimensional structure. The debt dynamics that conventional economics ignore is what actually drives that overall behaviour. So the implication of this is, and both the model and the data, is that debt prices are endemic to capitalism. And a colleague of mine, Richard Bay, who's a, a philanthropist now, he was a, a very successful banker in his professional career, he's looked back over the last 150 years and said that every crisis in capitalism has had two elements to it. About 150 crises across all countries over the last 1.5 centuries. He said, first of all, the ratio of private debt to GDP at 1.5 times GDP. And secondly, that ratio has grown by 17% more over a five-year period. Now that applies to every crisis. And we've only had financial crises in capitalism. We haven't had worker crises. We haven't yet had an environmental which we're about to experience. But that's endemic to capitalism. And I model it. This is the sort of behavior I get. Now again, I have time to sort of run the model for you? Or? Okay. <laughs> so I'm including the same basic <laughs> force structure I explained earlier. Now I'm doing it dynamically in three dimensions with prices as well. And what you see is apparent declining cycles in inflation, declining cycles in employment. If you're ignoring the debt ratio, everything's fantastic. The profit share seems to be stabilising as well. Workers are getting less income, which is happening down here. Who figures a shit about workers anyway? <laughs> and then without warning, suddenly the debt level starts to explode. Employment starts to collapse. And so does profit at the very end. You get no warning if you're looking in the short term, which is also dangerous for you uh, environmentally as well. Then the Christian will crash. So that's the world we actually live in. It's not the world the neoliberals believe in, but it's a real one we're in. And if I now look at the empirical data and say, what do we face in the future? Well, again, Japan managed to let us do a bit of a, a pre look in the same sense as my model did, similar time lag as well. Here, what I've done in this chart is I've taken the work of the private GDP across a number of countries in actual historical time, but I've shifted Japan's data forward 17 years, so it coincides 
price as well as another Japan data link from 1990, I've made it from 2007. And you can see the same trend in rising price of the GDP, then reaching a peak, and then declining after the crisis. And now if I look at the rate change in private debt, this is the important little element here. I'm explaining the spreadsheet here. Demand in our economies is not just out of income and circulation of existing money. It's also demand coming from debt, which is borrowed, money borrowed from existing and also spent at the same time. So total income, total expenditure in the economy is the sum of income plus the change in debt. I want I'm illustrating here and I'll hand the spreadsheet over to anyone who wants a copy. The downturn can occur in the economy simply if the rate of growth of debt slows down. And you don't need it to turn negative. The slowdown in the rate of growth of debt, when that exceeds the rate of growth of GDP, and when debt is a substantial proportion of the GDP as well, will cause the crisis. And again, you can play with the numbers there and illustrate it. Now, the crisis, true crisis begin, again, as Richard's empirical work has found, when your debt ratio is at the order of 1.5 times GDP, and almost the entire Western world is there, and China recently joined us. Welcome, China. Um, so we're going to face anemic credit growth from now on. What I also want to show you now is what's going to happen globally if we have to tolerate the same level of private debt growth that Japan has had for the last 25 years. So here what I've done again, taking the normal data for the rest of the world, but Japan's data has moved forward 17 years. And that shows us the sort of future we can expect, where most of the time, rather than credit expanding, being above the dotted line there and therefore causing additional demand and income is going to be below the dotted line and causing a slump. So that's what neoliberalism, we continue that practice, is going to bring our way. And they have no idea that it's why they're weak. It's a chance to take on the neoliberals because it's a wonderful line in a science fiction novel called uh, the, the Wind Up Girl. And it said, the sudden realization that the world he understands is not the one So how do we get out of this? The only solution to get out of this crisis is to reduce private debt drastically. And we've done it once before in history. We used a little bloke with funny mustache in the Second World War to do it. <laughs> Not an effective way to go about it, and better means in the future. And my idea is the modern, what I call it, it's called, now they call it PQE, People's Contact Easing. I first of all called it the modern debt trip, where my idea is slightly different from what's being put forward. Uh, by proponents of PQB, and that is to inject central bank created money directly into bad accounts, independent of whether people are in debt or not. Those in debt have to cancel their debt, so you reduce the debt levels directly that way. Those who are not in debt have a cash injection, so it doesn't benefit the people who are in debt and speculate it, those are those who are responsible and didn't. Both groups get the money. And that would then let you convert the base of the monetary system from being as credit based as it is now, and it's far too much credit money across it being part more fiat based and less credit based. And then also you have to restructure bank. You can't go back to continue behaving as they have in the last 30 years. Because they've been the real victims, victims, pardon me, of uh, neoliberalism, they've been the victims. So you have to reduce the appeal of uh, policy lending, which is things like marginal debt for speculating on spares, so shares and mortgage debt for speculating on houses. You've got to come good acronyms here. So my acronym for what I do for property speculation to get rid of all the bubbles in housing, I call the bill, <laughs> which has similarities to another important invention in the 1970s. <laughs> okay. Property income <laughs> and leverage. Limit the amount of leverage you can get a house against buying a property, not on the income of this borrower, which the banks always inflate, but on the maximum income that the property that's been purchased is effective to earn. This would address the housing issue we were talking about earlier. So rather than being able to get a loan you know, 20 times the deposit you've got or 50 times or whatever else, the maximum loan anyone could get would be 10 times, roughly speaking, 10 times the estimated income of the property being bought. And that would drastically reduce property prices, which would also drastically reduce inequality. And also, we have to enable the possible, make it possible for bankers to make money while lending. But they need good reasons. And the best reason bankers can lend, as Sean Hader argued century, almost a century ago, is to finance entrepreneurs. You can finance people with a good idea and no money. You want those ideas to be given a try to. So I, my acronym there is the deal. 
the entrepreneurial equity loan enable banks to lend and get a share of the equity. They'll lend to five entrepreneurs, four will last, one will succeed. They'll make a fortune out of the one that succeeds out of equity rather than interest. So you have to make it possible for them to be profitable for worthwhile reasons. Now, if we don't do something like this, our alternative is likely to be Japanese-style stagnation for the next 20 years. And frankly, that's what I expect. I don't expect humanity to make a sensible change before it's necessary. <laughs> I expect us to make changes only after serious crises. Now, what stops us doing that, by the way, and this is important, is a misplaced moral perception of debt. We think lending is like borrowing between individuals, where if you don't return what you borrowed, you rob the person of something they gave you, they've got to do without what they give it to you, and they had to earn an income before they had to lend it to you. Banks make money out of double entry book debt. It is not a case of them having to lend what they had beforehand. They make it up by putting two entries in a bank and a balance sheet. We've got to treat them not as warehouses, which is the vision we have of them at the moment, but as money factories. And just like ordinary factories produce too many cars, banks can produce too much money and have to write off the excess. Otherwise, we find ourselves in the crisis we're in now. So asset bubbles as well have been caused by this whole phenomenon, as has the inequality. We can reduce the level of private debt while also eliminate a large cause of the excessive inequality that we currently see under capitalism. And uh, that's what I teach my students in Houston. Thank you. <laughs>
So we'll keep pouring the money into the old system and keep it alive. No, we have, to, we, we have to maintain the capacity for engineers, the design systems that will get us out of this no, stinkhole no. we're in. And the problem is if we sit with a secular stagnation, we don't educate the engineers, we don't build the technology that might take production off planet, which I think ultimately we have to do. And we, we need to have the capability to invest to get out of this hole we're in. And when we do that, we're going to generate extra carbon emissions. We're going to generate an accelerated part of the process that's already causing the problem we're in because we've overshot. And unless we realise that, we're not going to get out of the hole in the first place. So my problem is this, and also we say in secular, secular stagnation, it won't be an intelligent diminution of our resources. It'll be a stupid <coughs> diminution of our resources consumption. That's really the problem. But my, my question then is, if we need another kind of investment to get out of this yeah. situation, um, how the, what, what are the, um, what are the policy incentives needed to make that happen? I think the policy incentive is something like a little lower than us, actually, I was speaking about earlier. Okay. <laughs> when you get to the stage where you simply can't consider the alternative, nobody ever wondered whether it was sensible to run a large deficit to build the Sherman tanks that were necessary to beat the Germans. Okay. It came down to simple desperation. We just we did it. It became a large scale enlistment of the entire population to achieve an aim which was beyond any question of accounting. Um, that's what we that's why we realise what climate change, the challenge of that is. I mean, we won't realise the climate it's too late. That's humanity. We already know we're probably melted the West Cape of Antarctica. We already know Greenland's gonna fall into the ocean. We know we're now we're liberating those sinkholes that we're seeing that up in um, in Siberia. We know that's explosion of methane. It's already happening. We have to be ready for the aftermath of that. It's too late to talk about tapering. Yeah, I buy your, well, a lot of your arguments, Steve. What about the issue, though, of rather than limiting lending to, or money creation for you know, 10 times income or property or something like that, what about the sovereign money argument that actually the state should yeah, create I mean, that I'm, money rather than stop, yeah, stopping mean, the, the banks totally doing this, that? This takes me outside of the environmental language. I'm talking about capitalism without the environmental problem. Yeah. Uh, I still see a role for private money creation in the sense that I've spent enough time with bureaucrats to know I don't want them making decisions about imagination. <laughs> yeah. I put up with them all the way time, I call them bureaucrasies. <laughs> and I understand why, why extreme capitalists and even Maggie Thatcher become anti-state and anti-government because I can see the bureaucratic psychology as well. I just came from a meeting where I had to sit there saying that the meeting was done properly. It wasted my bloody time for three hours. <laughs> Pardon me, this Australian French. Fucking boring meeting. Okay. And I, I, I didn't kind of, I, I wanted to say something, I had to say yes, the thing had been done properly, because I said no, it was annoyed everybody. So I kind of translated to say this Greek word for yes, which it sounds like no. In English, it's disturbing. Uh, I don't want people like that making decisions about whether Dyson gets funding for the next innovation of the Dyson, or whether you get money for real enough. So you do need to want to take a risk. But there need to be intelligent risks, which of course, Currently, the finance sector is making unintelligent risks. So, and I'm not sure that possibly the money has addressed that problem quite properly yet. Yeah. Ben and I can have a drink over it. Yes, Ben is accessible. Was well, somebody over there? Yes, it was. <coughs> but it was basically the same question. Do you really feel that we can invest ourselves out of the, you know, ecological situation? I don't. I think we're going to. I, well, I read Limits to Growth in 1972. And it's the most fun book in my entire collection. And the most intelligent, prescient work humanity's ever done. Completely ignored, largely because of my own profession, crashing it. So I think we've gone well past the point where we could learn the lessons they taught us. In that aftermath, we'll have no choice but to invest our way out of it. It's either that or let the whole ecological process of the planet remove us from the surface. And yeah. in doing that, we have to use, we, we'll be increasing our carbon generation, but, you know, we're going to be on a war footing. That's what Phil who said it earlier this morning, but that's the case. I think we're, we're in a war footing level when this finally happens. The days when we think we can actually take it towards the other situation of long past. Yes. Yeah, I have a question. What happened? No, 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 it's not you. You, you come next. <laughs> 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 it's the lady over there. Yeah. Uh, you said that uh, uh, if 
money that they get. But what about the people who don't have uh, any debt? That's then right. they'll have, actually have some money and that will increase their consumption of the citizens. And uh, I don't think we want to uh, increase the consumption of the citizens of the most Let us take a few questions more and then, then yeah. wrap up. Yeah. What happens if your uh, interest rate is zero in your office? Uh, well, um, you said wait a minute, wait a minute. Well, you got to remind me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah go on. No, you, 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 you got, you got the computer. That's <laughs> <laughs> some wine as well. <laughs> when you're saying compensation for people, yes, basically the way I see it, it's undermining the role of the private banks to create money by having a state where you but the logical step continuing that would be why does the government just create all the money? That comes back to the other point, yeah. Yeah, it's the same, but, but the logical step would be that. Why do you want to try to make you talk about creating one thousand? Okay, wait a minute. Now we have the lady over there. You're really pushing my luck with all this wine. Yeah. Only about private debt, but there is also a debt about government. <coughs> that was the next to last question. Now it's the last question. Okay. 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 Okay.
for this. That is a slow. Muscle. 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 I was, at a, I was at a conference recently about green growth and they did an analysis of South Korea, green growth plan, we put a lot of money into green growth. Yeah. And what they saw was that it was incremental CO2 because they added the green growth to what already had economic Yeah, that's the point, yeah. Like that. So all it was was extra. Yeah. That's it right. It wasn't the CO2 so For a while it's going, going to be extra. It's we extra to accept that. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I, I, I have a paper in my computer that I can share with you tomorrow mm -hmm. that is written by a French professor, Jacobici, that, that explains the relationship, or the, the, the close link between growth or development, or whatever we call it, yeah. and, and the demand. And, yeah. and it's a phenomenal paper, uh, and that, that will somewhat be said. Mm -hmm. um, another issue that I don't think have been really thoroughly research is let's assume that we use the fossil fuels we now have and build a renewable energy system and it will last for 20, 25, 20 years. How do we renew that system without fossil fuels? That has not been done. And it's a, it's a, it's a very interesting question uh, and goes along with what you said. Yeah. Well, um, I think you have left us with um, a lot of um, food for folks. So I think <laughs> <laughs>